Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for another Tank Talk podcast. So happy you are here. Thank you to everybody who's shown such great support over the last four to six weeks. Can't say how much we appreciate it. We've got a good one today for you. Today, John, we are going to be talking about what makes somebody a fish keeping expert. I sent you a Facebook post a little while ago, about a week ago or a couple days ago. I don't remember exactly how long ago it was. And the reason we're doing this podcast is this Facebook post. It was an individual. You might have seen it. If you did, just we're not here to harass people. I'm not going to mention any names. But the Facebook post went something like this. A, there's too many people in fish keeping who claim to be experts. And really, the only experts in fish keeping are those who have advanced degrees. In other words, the people who are experts are those who have been recognized by a credentialing agency or a body or their peers and have degrees in aquaculture, fish health, or you know any number of marine biology. And as somebody who's had some of these degrees, I've got a master's degree in aquaculture or master certain aquaculture and fish health and a master's degree in biotechnology and chemical science. Well, I don't necessarily know if I 100% agree with the, the premise. And I'm curious, John, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm somebody who uh, understands the. Okay. This is very difficult for me to say because I have the highest level of respect for you and your certifications and your degrees and, and all of that. I, I brag on you all the time for that and call you the professor, but also because you are a professor. Um, I respect people who have advanced degrees and, and did the college and all of that kind of stuff. So believe me, I'm not going to poo-poo that at all. However, I also understand the, the importance of experience. And I understand that, you know, I know a lot of dumb people that are book smart. Uh, degrees don't, degrees make you an expert on paper, but I don't know that they make you a, a an actual expert in what it is that you're talking about. I don't know, maybe I'm making myself sound like a jerk there, but I, I think that, you know, some of the dumbest people I know have college degrees and a lot of the the smartest people I know never did a day in college. So I'm kind of wishy-washy on this. I, I definitely agree. I definitely respect people that have gone through the, the college process and gotten those certifications and those degrees. I put the highest level of respect on that, but I don't think it's required to be an expert if, you have, if, if, if somebody has years and years and decades and all of that experience. But then again, I also understand experience doesn't make you an absolute expert either. So it's tough. It's a tough, um, it's a tough topic. And if I'm being honest with you, I'm really uh, anticipating and very excited to hear your take on it because you're somebody that can speak from a completely different angle than I can. Well, when I saw the post initially, it, it's, it just struck me the wrong way. And I think what struck me the wrong way is how we're defining who and what an expert is in a certain field, the fact that they have to be formally recognized by a credentialing agency to be somehow an expert in their field. I don't know if that's necessarily the way that I would define an expert. And if we are going to define an expert in that way, then I would also say that an expert is not necessarily 100% useful in the aquarium hobby. So if we're going to narrowly define an expert that way, then I'm going to say that maybe that word doesn't have the meaning that we think it does. Because like you, again, with somebody who's got both the things, I've got the, the paper degrees, but I also have 44 years of fish keeping experience. And I can tell you 90% of what I learned, I learned through experience. The difference is what the paper degrees did is they allowed me to understand why certain things are happening but it didn't allow me to discover that the things are happening and these are best practices in the aquarium hobby. I have a really good philosophy and maybe you do as well. I belong to a lot of fish clubs. I talk to a lot of people who have been in the, the industry for or in the hobby for 50, 60 years longer than I have and have been more serious about it for a much longer period of time than I have. Because let's face it, as a kid, as a teenager, you don't have fish rooms. You're not breeding you know, dozens of different species of fish. Well, some of these people in these clubs have been, 
do you know what I do when I'm around them? I, well, I'll tell you what I don't do. Well, that's a very interesting thing, but me as a master of certain aquaculture and fish health, <laughs> let me tell you a different way. No, you know what I do? I shut my mouth, I open my ears, I sit back quietly, and I listen to the experts. Why? Mm. Because they have expertise in certain areas of fish keeping that I do not have. And I think that's one of the main things that I think that's probably one of the things I wanna start out with. If we define an expert in the sciences, right? So, cause we're talking about fish keeping, we're talking about aquaculture, we're talking about the aquarium hobby. In reality, people that we would normally call experts in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, most of the people, by the time they get to that expert level, especially if they've got doctoral degrees, are so incredibly narrowly focused on one minute issue or problem in whatever they're studying, they practically become not as well-rounded as some other people. And so we have to be really careful when we talk about, okay, what is an expert? Well, these experts are people who have focused on for instance, if they were in cell bio, they might focus on a, a, a protein that does something in one metabolic pathway, and they can spend years and years and years and years studying that. If we transfer that over to the aquarium hobby, you might have somebody who is an expert in some very narrow field of fish physiology that absolutely positively does not transfer over into aquarium keeping in any <laughs> practical sense. And yet we're calling these people an expert because they have a, an advanced degree when really the overwhelming majority of people who are in the aquarium hobby would be much better served by listening to the people who have 20, 30, 40 years of experience and can teach them practical fish keeping methodology. I've actually worked with people who were in universities who were breeding African cichlids for fish studies. And you know what? They were not an expert in Af African fish keeping or African cichlid mm -hmm. breeding. They did this as a means to study some very, very narrowly focused part of fish metabolism. And so you've gotta be really careful when we use that word to describe who is an expert and we are relying disproportionately on whether or not they have a formal degree, we could be doing a serious disservice. You know, the other thing I, I will say, Oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you well, go. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I've got two very brief uh, examples of, of the way I feel about this. Uh, I am personal friends with someone that you, you are aware of, uh, Miss Diana Wallstead. Uh, she is a legend in the aquarium hobby. She wrote the book called The Ecology of the Planted Aquarium. It is a must read for anybody that's interested in keeping live plants in aquariums. There's a lot of people that have taken her methods and they've kind of, you know, tweaked them a little bit and acted like they invented this whole process. But it was Diana that came up with this. And I've spent, I don't know how many, 20, 30 hours just sitting down listening to her talk about her process, her methods, why she does what she does. And you wanna know how many times I've asked her about her educational background? The answer is zero. Because she gives me information that makes so much sense. Her book makes so much sense. She might be a PhD doctorate, which is the same thing, but she might have all the certifications in the world. I don't know, and I don't care. Another example, we were at a we were, were members of the Raleigh Aquarium Club in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we went to one and there was a guy there and you know, I got to be careful with this Jason cuz you and I are getting ready to enter this category you a whole lot sooner than me. Uh, <laughs> we are going to be classified as old timers here very soon. Uh, but this guy was what I would refer to as an old timer, uh, significantly older than me, had been doing this for so long that you know, aquariums probably weren't even invented yet. He was probably had something to do with inventing it. He was a guy that for hundreds, not hundreds, but decades and decades has been breeding Corydoras. I have no interest in how to breed Corydoras. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to be a jerk when I say that. I'm just, that's, I love Corydoras, but I'm not really into the whole idea of breeding them. He did a talk at the meeting, um, about breeding Corydoras, and it was 
fascinating watching his presentation, seeing all of the things, all of the science behind it that he was talking about, all the different methods that he uses, the, the trials, the tribulations, everything that he's done, the successes. Never once did I stand up and say, excuse me, sir, before you tell us any more about what you're saying, could you please give me your credentials and let me know what certifications you have and how long you went to school for it? I don't care. This guy made a lot of sense. He was explaining things to me in a way that I understood, I appreciated that, and it made me interested in something that I didn't walk into that meeting being interested in. And so to me, I'm going to call that guy an expert because he's done it for decades upon decades and had an answer, a very thorough answer for every single question that was asked to him, not by me, because I'm too scared to get up and ask people questions. He was brilliant at it, and Diana too. So, you know, I, I don't think the, the certifications and the certificate on the wall automatically that you have to have that in order to be an expert. So there's my two cents. And I 100% agree. Like I said before, and I want to reiterate it now, I think what the degrees helped me understand or, or allowed me to understand is the why. Why are things happening? So for instance, when I put out a video in one of my science series, video or science series um, series or playlist and I talk about okay well you can clean sponge filters in tap water we do it every week we do it for every single tank we don't divide them up like, oh one sponge filter one week one the next no they all go in tap water chlorinated tap water we clean them out back in the in the tanks they go same thing with the hang on back filter media these canister filters all go in in tap water rinse that stuff out back in the tanks they're going to go I have been doing that for a long time and I explained in those videos the why is it okay, right? Contact time with chlorine and chloramines, that kind of thing. But guess what? I wasn't the first person in the world to figure this out. There have been people who have been doing this for 30 years. I'm like, and you would see it in the comments of those videos. Yeah, I'm glad you said something. I've been doing this since 1982. I'm like, well, I haven't been doing this since 1982. <laughs> so clearly you knew this worked way before I ever discovered it. All I did was put something out there on social media that explained the science by as to why it's okay. I didn't discover anything new. I'm not telling anybody, the, the old timers who have been doing sponge filters for 30 years, something that they haven't known before. And they, it, what's interesting is when you talk to them at the clubs, like, oh yeah, I saw your video about sponge filters. I've been doing it for 30 years. Of course the chlorine and chloramine isn't going to kill the bacteria that fast. Everybody knows that. It's like, well, you knew that. And you know, a lot of the old timers did, but then Somehow, I if they were to say that, maybe somebody would be like, oh, I, I don't necessarily believe what they're saying. But then if you put a little bit of science behind it, sometimes it makes – at the same time, the truth was still the truth. And doing that is still perfectly okay. You know what's funny about that? First of all, the first bit of content that you and I ever did together was on that exact topic. Mm -hmm. You were a guest on my live stream and we talked about that. Uh, I believe the title of it was Breaking All the Rules. Uh, because oh my that's, gosh, I remember that. Yeah, you doing that and being, dare I say, brave enough to talk on social media about doing that because everyone else, including me, was would always tell people, rinse it in clean in, in tap uh in in tank water i mean it, yeah. and and the reason why i do that i don't understand the science behind it so i understand i i completely agree with what you said you know there's an angle to it that i don't know because i haven't read the book and and taken the courses that you have but i know i've i knew that i have taken sponge filters to the uh to the sink and rinsed them out before and not had any problems but to me, the easiest way, if I'm delivering a message to somebody who knows even less than I do, the safest way is to say, hey, you take some water out of your aquarium, use that, squeeze it out, put it in there. And the funny thing about it is that people would probably say that people that don't know any better would say that I'm the expert and I said you should do it in tank water. You, the one that has master's degrees and knows the science behind it you are the one that's wrong which is just ridiculous <laughs> yeah so. and, and don't get me wrong and i don't want to completely disregard what the original poster was stating and that is 
there is a certain amount of credibility that goes along with these advanced degrees and, and being able to be you know credentialed by peers and go through a vetting process. There's absolutely value to that. If there wasn't value to it, I wouldn't have done what I did. So there's there's absolutely value there. But what I the, the problem I had with the post was to use that term expert only pertaining to people who have the degrees as opposed to don't. If you look at the way we have perceived experts over the last five years, whether it's public health or our economy, these are truly people who have been considered to be experts in their field. How well has that worked out over the last four or five years when it pertains to public health? How well has that worked out when it comes to the economy? So you have to be very careful when it comes to who you're trusting, even if they've got credentials. Now, when you look at the, the sciences STEM, here's an interesting statistic for you. In the soft sciences like psychology, there is a large percentage of research that is not repeatable. I think we all know this intuitively. When you go on the internet and you read something about, oh, this is the best way for you know to experience life to its fullest. And then a week later, you go to that same website and they've got a different article posted by different <laughs> experts saying, no, it turns out that was all wrong. This is now the new best way. And it just keeps flip-flopping. In the soft sciences, that ear repro reproducibility is somewhere 60, 70, 80%. Like, well, all right, that's psychology. That's a really difficult subject. There's a lot going on there. Guess what? Even in the hard sciences like biology and chemistry, especially in things like cancer research, scientists are starting to figure out, wow, there's a lot of research here. We can't reproduce these results either. And so when scientists are using procedures from papers that have been posted in prestigious journals, they're like, this isn't working. What, what you posted, the procedure that you're posting and the results that we're supposed to be seeing, it's not working. And I need this information to do the part of, that I wanna that I want to focus on. So we have to be really careful. And I'm not saying that science is corrupt or that you can't trust it. Of course you can. But you do have to be careful when you are, are ascribing a term like expert to only people who have a piece of paper in their face and not someone who's got lots and lots of experience over a course of a lifetime. You know, I, I'm somebody that I've always, and, and we are talking about things right now that are way over my head, but I'm, I'm going to add my two cents wherever I can. Um, I like to introduce human analogies when we're talking about fish keeping stuff and some people ridicule me for that because they're like it's not like people but i think it's the easiest way to make things make sense and when you're talking about experience being necessary and and i completely agree with that i i, I don't even think that's up for debate that experience is required in in so many things if not then how come people can't come straight out of college and become a federal judge if if you don't require experience how come there is this whole thing called a residency in order to get a medical degree? You have to go in there and physically do this job for years before you're able to get that certification and actually be a practicing medical doctor. You know, you have to get those experiences. When, when I was a police officer, you know, there were people that had criminal justice degrees that you know, went to four years of, of, of college and either got a bastard, bastards, bachelor's or master's <laughs> degree. I combined the two words. But guess what? When they started on the police department, they started at the exact same place I did, which was ground zero, because no matter what your degrees are, no matter how smart you are as, as pertains to the law, you still have to go through the police academy just like everybody else does. So yeah. if if you don't require experience, how come... You have, how come there's a police academy? How come there's residencies in hospitals? How come there's clerks at courthouses and interns? Experience is the most important element of somebody's expertise. And so, you know, I, I, I have to say that without experience, I feel like it'd be hard to call anybody an expert in, in any field, let alone and fish that, keeping. You're one hundred percent right. And let's let's make this let's make it real right now. And you just did with all those examples. But let's take the sciences. Let's take somebody who is into aquaculture and fish health. They're gonna take a bunch of classes. They're gonna read a bunch of books. They're gonna have to take a bunch of tests. But guess what? At this point, the way that secondary the, the way that college education is moving, you can do all that stuff online. 
a lot of people now take courses and I teach a lot of courses that are hybrid. You do watch my videos about the, the, the details, the, the test taking, all that stuff on your own time. But the experience is the lab. You come to class for the lab and that's where you apply everything that you've learned. And to say that somebody needs to be credentialed to, to be an expert, I don't think that makes any sense because what you just described and what I'm just describing is that person who's been fish keeping for 40 years, they've essentially got 40 years worth of lab work, right? Mm -hmm. They have 40 years of the application and the, the book smarts, if you will, the coursework, they can do that on their own time. You can, you, at this point now, information is commoditized, which means it's nearly free, right? You're watching this podcast, you're getting our expertise, you're getting our experience for free, right? And that's the same thing on YouTube. It's offered now for free. Anybody can do that, that the world is wide open. With any interest you have, it doesn't matter if you want to fix a Harley, if you want to fish keep, if you want to do woodworking, you can go on the internet and find somebody who's got the expertise or the massive amounts of experience to tell you exactly how to do the thing. Because let's face it, everything we're learning about, all of the things that you read, all of the videos that you watch, ultimately, or at least usually, the purpose of that is to apply it and actually do something. Keep fish healthy, learn how to do a water change, learn how to set up an aquarium, learn how to cycle an aquarium, learn how to fix a motorcycle, learn how to put together a piece of furniture. That's why you're doing it. And so that, that coursework is just a stepping stone and you can get that same information, quality information on the internet, mostly for free, and then use that in your application, in your fish room or keeping fish. Yeah. And you know, it makes so much sense what you were saying before about, um, experience and, and it's a different level when the, the book education part of it helps you to understand the why behind certain things. And, and I'm reminded of, again, you know, using the human analogy here, when I was on the police department, I spent 10 weeks in Brunswick, Georgia at the federal law enforcement training center, 10 of the best weeks of my life. Uh, we went through like three weeks of just nonstop book in the classroom, learning the laws, learning the codes, learning all of these things. And then we had a day where, we had a two hour block. There was 48 recruits in this class and we were doing what's called seminitions training, which is basically using live firearms, but they have seminition rounds in it, which are basically paintballs, but they're, you know, bullet size paintballs, you know, uh, nine millimeter paintballs. And so you have to gear up and be all completely protected and, and all of that kind of stuff. And you actually get into live fire situations that are to put you in that mindset. And we were so excited about all of this. And we show up there at six o'clock in the morning and we're all geared up with our firearms and our simunition rounds and we're ready to go into these scenarios. And the first thing the sergeant said was, listen to me, you're gonna learn more in the next two hours than you've learned the entire time you've been down here so far. And it's because we're taking everything that we've learned in the books and we're going to the lab and we're implementing everything that we've learned in a real life scenario. And he was absolutely right. Because when you experience that thing, you have that fish laying on its side and you're figuring out what to do to fix it. There's nothing better as far as learning how to remedy that problem. You can read about it all you want, but actually doing it is a completely different thing. And, and to me, that's where the real expertise comes from. And, and I just have to add before you come back into this, I don't know too many people on the internet that are creating content for social media about fish keeping that are calling themselves experts. I'm just saying, I know at that, least I'm not. No. And I don't either because I recognize just talking, like I said, talking to people in these clubs, I've got a lot to learn. You're always learning this it's almost like an infinite number of fish. There's an infinite number of ways you can combine them. There's different, there's different ecosystems. There's different methodologies that you can use. And you're always learning something. I feel like the more you learn, the less you know, in a sense, right? The less you realize, <laughs> wow, or the more you realize, I don't know half of what I think I know because I just learned a whole bunch of stuff I've never even considered before by having a 10 minute conversation with somebody. So you're absolutely right. It is all about the doing. And it's especially true 
you know, we, we talked about it in a previous podcast when we were talking about breeding fish for profit and we were talking about bringing in fish. And I made a comment in that video and I said, it's actually far, far, far more challenging to import fish and bring them in. Why? Because normally when you're breeding fish, they start out in a healthy aquarium, they've got healthy parents and there's not, oh, they're, they're not being shipped anywhere. They're not being overly stressed. But when you start bringing fish in, there's a lot of things that can happen. They're being shipped halfway across the world. Temperatures change, water parameters change. You get them in and maybe they don't like the situation. Maybe they don't like your water parameters. Maybe they were carrying something or maybe they were perfectly fine, but there was some type of bacteria or virus or protist in the aquarium. You put them in there, they were fine, but they've never been exposed to that thing before. And now you've got an issue. That's why quarantine is so important. So you can read all about fish disease and oh, well, this little white spot over here could mean this, and this white spot can mean something else. And if your fish are lethargic, that could mean something completely different. But until you actually have the fish day after day, week after week, month after month, and it's not just one fish, right? So experience is not just, oh, I've been keeping fish for 44 years, because you could keep fish for 44 years like I have and keep one fish tank. It's not the length of time that necessarily matters. It's just like you, when you had your hundreds of aquariums in your garage and you had the pet store and you, so you could pro, you could easily make an argument, even when it comes to the amount of time you've been in there. If you kept fish in a garage for, let's say five years and you had a couple hundred tanks and you were breeding all different types of fish, you were keeping all different types of fish, you have way, way, way more experience than someone who's been keeping fish for 25 years, but has only had one or two aquariums in their home at any given time. Right. True. And that's, that's something that you have to consider. And I think that's, that kind of leads us into our next part. And that is how do we know if the information we're getting, regardless of the label we put on the person or the source, how do we know if it's good information? And I would, I would say, as we have been saying experience, but that experience can be length of time. It can be the diversity of experience that the person has. It can be the sheer volume of experience someone has had because again, I've seen people go from no fish tanks to a hundred in the course of a year. And oh my gosh, they're keeping dozens, if not hundreds of different species. There's a lot more, they're getting it in a crash course to be sure, but there's a lot more experience there than someone who's had fish for 15 years, but they've only had one or two tanks and they do what most people do. They, they bring fish in and you know, they, they keep them. And then as they, as they get older and die, they, they replace them. But it's not just the length of time, it's also the breadth, right? How many different types of fish have you kept? What different types of environments? Yeah, I'm somebody that uh, I, I, in my videos, I regularly will say things like, the book might not say this, but this is what I have experienced. And there's, there's no book. I, I don't know, I'm not referencing a specific book, uh, but you know, I, I kind of, always act as if there's this this mystical rule book that's out there that that tells you so many different things that, that you have to do things this certain way and to me anybody in this hobby that says there is only one way to do things that is somebody i am not going to take advice from yeah. because what you live in illinois i live in north carolina our water is very different our climate is very different our prices are very different, uh, <laughs> but it's a very different thing. What works for you in Illinois might not work for me here. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of Lisa went through a little spell when we had our store of breeding angels. Angels are so much fun to breed. They're, they're just a blast. And um, she got in the practice of removing, she would put a piece of slate vertically in the in there the angels thankfully would find that and that's where they would lay their eggs on she would remove them and incubate the eggs on her own methylene blue air you know all of that kind of stuff and it worked out really well uh there was a, a gentleman that came in one time and i was so proud of her when she did this the guy came in and he was flustered because he wanted to breed his angels but he couldn't get it to work he said the angels would breed and then they would eat the eggs or the eggs would rot out or, you know, whatever it is. And he could never get them to, to be re real viable eggs. And Lisa said, well, have you entertained the idea of pulling the eggs out? And the guy was like, 
well, I, no, nobody ever told me I could do like I don't I didn't read anything about that. I, I just, I'm so the parents are supposed to clean them and protect them. And I, 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 and it was like a completely foreign concept to him because wherever he got his information, that wasn't relayed to him that you could do that. It's more work because you're basically becoming the parents of those eggs and you got to get in there and take your turkey baster and suck out the bad eggs and do all of that. But, you know, t- his mind was blown. Like, I didn't realize you could even do that. And so, you know, what the book says isn't always necessarily the best way to do something. And, and you know, there's 3.2 million different ways to do every single aspect of this, com- of this hobby. And it completely depends on you, your environment, what you have, your setup, where you're getting your fish from, all of that. So I, I kind of feel like, it's impossible for there to even exist a expert in this because there's so many different ways of doing it. That's absolutely a great point. And the more it's the reason why we've got this thing called AI starting to happen in the sciences. One of the problems that we deal with is you've got, I mentioned this before, but you've got all of these people dealing with this, this very, very, very narrow, subject matter right a single protein or a single stretch of amino acids on a protein and this happens in 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 ichthyology which is the study of fish as well we've got all these people studying these very narrow concepts well how do you take one concept that somebody has or some some truth claim and compare it to all the others and then make it a something that you can use right make it practical and that's where things like ai and you've got these meta uh, studies that are done where you have people that where this is what they do. They they take all of this different research in an area, try to put it all together and then come up with a holistic view based on that. And it's becoming more and more and more difficult as more information is added to the to our knowledge base. I don't remember who said it. I, I was and I was in a I was in an in service for my school where we have faculty, we sit around and talk about education stuff. And one of the people that was presenting I'm going to mess up the time, but it was it was shocking to me. They said something like, and I'm not quoting them exactly, the amount of information that humans discover, new information, the, the amount of discoveries doubles like every few years. That is insane. There is hmm. no way we as human beings can keep up with all the new information that all these scientists and all these people are figuring out. There's no like one database. There's no big giant glob cloud mine it's like oh now i've got this piece and this piece we'll put it all together with all the billions and trillions of other pieces of information we have so and it's again it gets back to this the idea what you just mentioned of the expert you can be an expert you mentioned the corridor the breeder he's an expert in what he does because he's been doing it forever he knows all the different species he knows how they're going to breed he knows the water parameters he knows oh you know what i noticed that if you turn the lights on six minutes and 27 seconds later on average this quarry and this these quarries are going to start laying eggs all over the glass but i only notice that if my water temperature temperatures are 75 degrees as soon as they go to 78 degrees they don't do that but that only matters if my ph is this and my water hardness is that that's an expert Mm -hmm. that person has done the lab portion and that's what makes people actually accumulate knowledge the reading stuff somebody else already figured that out and you're learning why but you're not learning the the hows. And that's what's the experience is. The experience is I figured out the how, and then we can have other people figure out the whys too. But both of those people are experts because you can't have one without the other. If you don't have the people doing the how, which are the, the, the people who've been in the hobby for 30 years, you don't even have the why. You don't even, you don't have the base to even begin to ask the questions of why this is happening. It's a scientific method. It's the first thing that happens is an observation. And so the people who are studying the why this is happening, that observation often comes from somebody else who's done the, oh, this is how it happens sort of information. So I have a question for you. Are you ready? Oh boy. I hope so. Because I want to make this really practical for people. How does somebody know if, if they're, whatever subject they're looking at, especially if it's related to fish, how do they know that the information they're getting is reliable? What would you tell them? I would say, you know, I, I was brought up in this hobby to listen to the the, the old timers, 
which again, you know, we're about to be there. But to me, I would look at, well, the what the person is telling you, you should know whether or not that person is like has the experience. I don't know how I'm trying to say this. Like if a guy comes to an aquarium club meeting and he says, I, you know, I'm 71 years old and I've been breeding Corydoras since I was in my early 30s. I've been doing this forever and I've done it all these different ways. I've tried all these different methods and I've bred hundreds of thousands of Corys. I'm, I'm going to take that guy. I don't care what he says about his high school education. He, he could tell me, or his education as a whole, not just high school. He could say, I dropped out when I was a sophomore in high school. That's not going to make me listen to him less. It's him saying, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time. And to me, this is a personal thing. And I, I don't know how you feel about it. But I start to kind of veer away from somebody if they say they're an expert, you know, if they're, if the guy is like, Hey, or the gal is like, Hey, listen, I've been doing this for a long time. I got a lot of experience in it and I'm going to share with you my experiences in it. Okay. You've got my attention. Even if it's something about breeding Corydoras, which I have no interest in. So it's how the information is packaged and how it's delivered. And it's delivered based on experiences, not what a book says that. I, I would tend to absorb that information and trust that information more than if it was just somebody that stood up there and bragged, look at my certificates, look at what I have. This is why you should believe everything I say. I, I don't, I, I typically don't like to go towards those people. Yeah, I hope that answers I, your I, question. No, it, it does. And what I usually, because it's, it's, it's so confusing, especially for people who are newer either to the hobby or they're newer to some certain part of the hobby. And so even people who are listening now, you might have been in the hobby for a long time, but as your interest levels change in different parts of the hobby, like, hey, I've always kept community fish. Now I wanna start keeping some cichlids. I wanna do something different. How do you know what you're hearing is reliable? And you're absolutely right. You want somebody, essentially, if they're if you're listening to their experience, that's usually gonna be one of the main things, right? Are they having success doing what they're doing? The other thing that we talk about in the sciences, and I think it's still really important when it comes to just people researching different aspects of fish keeping, consensus, right? When you start hearing, okay, this this person, let's say someone's got five years of experience, they give you some information. Well, hopefully that's not the only person you're going to take advice from. You go out on YouTube, you read books, you talk to people who are pet store owners or employees, and you start asking questions and if you've got, okay, the next person told me the same thing and the next person like, oh my gosh, now we've got consensus. We have agreement on a certain subject matter and that can be so important. So when you have these people and you've got four or five people and they're all telling you the same thing, that might be some reliable information. But devil's advocate here. Yeah. You know, you're one of the only guys on the internet that's telling people, hey, go rinse out your sponge filters at the faucet. Now, now here's the thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but let's just use that particular topic because uh, that's kind of a hot button issue. Rinsing out sponge filters in a tank, in a bucket full of tank water or under the sink. Well, neither one of those issues are really wrong. Neither one of those strategies are wrong, are they? There's not, you're not going to see a downside to doing it in tank water over tap water. But, you know, you, the consensus online is you should be doing this in tap water. But we both know that's not necessarily true. So, well, that's, that, that's the other thing. And I think if we circle all the way back around to the original post on Facebook, what the person was trying to get at is there's a lot of what we call bro science out there, right? It's yes. things that people hear and they repeat it and they repeat it and they don't put any thought into it. And then there's what we like to call in the science is the paradigm shift where everything you thought you knew about a particular subject, something changes. And that can be really, that can be a hard habit to break. People do not like a paradigm shifting idea in their brain because they thought they knew the world in a certain way, whether it's breeding quarries or washing all filters and in, in tap water they thought they knew truth they thought they knew the way to do it because of the consensus and we have to be open to other ideas 
whether it's filters, you know, cleaning filters, or whether or not you even have a filter on your aquarium or planted tanks. But specifically, the example that you just mentioned about the sponge filter is okay. So you've been told, hey, you can clean your sponge filter, clean your sponge filters in tap in in tank water. You're right. There's no harm in that. And so what I tell people is, listen, if you don't want to clean, I'm, I, I don't care. I really don't care <laughs> if you clean your filters in a bucket full of tank water or in the sink. Let me tell you why we do it the way we do it. And the, way, the reason we do it is, one, we don't use buckets because we have a, a water system that kind of drains all of our water into a floor drain. So there's not an opportunity there. Two, I did it that way for a while. I'm like, logically, this isn't making any sense to me because I'm draining water into a bucket. I'm taking this nasty sponge filter and the minute I start squeezing the stuff out, you're releasing nastiness into the water, the bucket, and then just sucking it back in the minute you release the sponge again. So all you're doing is, yeah, you're releasing some of the detritus, but you're still got this nasty thing that's still disgusting. When I take them to the sink, I can squeeze them out in fresh water, chlorinated to be sure, but all that brown stuff goes away. It is the reason why. Listen, I can't hide. If my tanks are a disaster, I can't hide that in my videos, right? They are the background <laughs> of all of my videos. If these tanks look horrible, what am I supposed to do? I can't hide that. Same, people have watched our videos for years on end. Our tanks look pretty good. Our water usually looks pretty clear. Why? Because when I take the sponge filters and I clean them in tap water, I get all that nastiness out. The microbes are still attached to the surfaces of the sponge filter. And now that sponge filter can do the mechanical filtration that it does, which by the way, sucks even when it's a perfectly functioning sponge filter. But <laughs> trust me, that's why our tank water is relatively clear just using sponge filters because we maintain them every single week in that way. But again, if you like doing it in tank water, keep doing it. It's not hurting anything. It's just making it slightly less efficient when it comes to pulling stuff out of the water column. We need that part. That's why we've gone to doing them in the sink. Other people, if they're not showing them on a camera and they like the way their tank looks, or they've got a hang on back filter in there that's doing all the mechanical, so be it. Not a big deal. So you're absolutely right. You do have to be, con you do have to be careful with the consensus when it's just bro science people. And I see this all the time. I was talking about the nitrogen cycle or certain water parameters. I can almost tell where someone, especially if it's a newer video, it's like, okay, well, you got that from this person. You said that because this person said it. And you can almost see the, the line of thought and where they pulled from all these other videos. But again, it's still the experience, right? And some of these things, if people are getting the same experience that other people have come before them doing the same thing, then there is some credibility there. Yeah, I mean, I think that that the original poster, um, I, I think they were probably frustrated by some of the things that that I also am frustrated on online, where you see these trends that happen, and and like you said, it's it's bro science. You get somebody that is popular in the in the hobby. Uh, you and I would fall into that category just simply based on numbers. It, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, we're popular guys, but our numbers say that we are. And what we say carries weight, even if we're wrong. And so, you know, there are, there are some opinions that get treated in our community as gospel simply because of the person that said it. And you know, I, I just got done earlier telling you, you know, if you find that the person that you're listening to is somebody that you trust based on how they deliver the message or whatever, it, it, then that's, you know, you should be able to trust them, do what they say and, and take their advice. Um, you know, what if that person is telling you something completely different than what the majority is saying, you know, and, and you're a great example of that, you know, with, you know, you're really one of the only people I know of online that will tell people, yeah, take your sponge filters to the sink. I trust you with anything you say in this hobby because I know you, but as a fan, somebody that doesn't know you, they, they might look at that and be like, whoa, what, what's, what is that? Like, how come everybody else says this, this way? And, but I think where the mistake is made is automatically taking somebody's words as gospel simply because of their numbers on yeah. social media. Oh, for sure. 
you know, we were we were talking about sponge filters earlier. I, I'm not going to name names because I'm not in the business of trying to, to trash people or anything. And I don't necessarily believe that this person deserves to be trashed. But there is a person out there that sells sponge filters that are completely different from what everybody else sells. That are, you know, you've got these sponge filters that are built a certain way with a, a very fine sponge to pick up, pick up all of the fine particles and stuff like that. But this person over here is selling very coarse sponge filters. Logic would tell you that's not going to pick up the finest particles. But because that person and I, hey, that person's sponge filters are fine. I'm not I'm not trying to poo poo a product here. I'm just saying because that person is very popular and has a lot of pull in the industry, it's it's going to be believed by a lot of people. Well, that's definitely the best way to do it because that person said and so I think that there's there's a lot of numbers making people believe that a person is more of an expert than they actually are, which is why I'm always my numbers. You know, I don't I'm not the biggest channel out there. I'm, I'm one of the larger ones, but I'm always very quick to tell people, hey, listen, I'm just a dummy in northeast North Carolina. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just sharing with you my experiences. This is what I think. And the reason why I frame my content that way is because that's what I would want to hear if I'm looking for content. I don't want somebody telling me they're an expert. They, you're going to lose me. It, it's yeah. different if I'm going looking for a heart surgeon. You know, I want somebody that is as arrogant and has more belief in themselves than anybody else in the world. But when we're talking about a hobby that is that can be done so many different ways, I, I tend to, to veer off when people claim that they're experts. And I certainly don't think including myself numbers make an expert numbers, numbers are, are numbers. irrelevant um, because I've known plenty of people who've never been on any kind of social media. And like we said, I mean, all these old school people from these clubs are insanely, insanely knowledgeable and they don't have any influence in, in the hobby to the, to the right. extent that a lot of people on YouTube do. But the other thing too is, and you touched on this, it's nuance. What you hear people say, there, there's actually, and it brings up two points. There is a difference between an expert and somebody who is really good at educating other people. Ideally, you'd like to have both. You'd like to have an expert. And again, we can define the expert as someone with tons of experience as someone who has a mix of experience along with some type of a credential. But in the end, it doesn't matter if that person makes a truth claim, but can't fully explain that truth claim. And so let's, let's talk about uh, the, the sponge filter situation. I will say, hey, here's why you can do it in tap water. Here's the science behind it. You know, we talk about contact time. The microbes aren't going to die from the limited amount of chlorine or chloramine that they're exposed to. They're going right back in your tank with fresh water. Even if you kill off some of the beneficial bacteria in the filter, you're going to get exponential growth after that. Now, the microbes don't, those particular microbes don't grow super fast, but they will repopulate the small amount of surface area that you might have wiped out. Not only that, but the microbes are growing everywhere in your aquarium, not just on the filtration. And so as you do this over time, the other microbes are going to compensate the ones that are growing on your driftwood on the surface of your plants on the surface of glass on the upper levels of your substrate there's nuance there so if i were to say oh hey you know what you're fine clean all your sponge filters and tap water but then i don't explain those other things guess what's going to happen you're going to have somebody with a bare bottom tank maybe it's a breeding tank and they've got 50 peacock juvenile peacocks that are an inch and a half in a 29 gallon and they clean the only filter they have in tap water and oh, by the way, they didn't do it for the 20 or 30 seconds that I do. They left it in there for a couple minutes, put that thing back in, and guess what's going to happen next day? You're going to wake up to 50 dead fish. Mm -hmm. The problem in the hobby and the thing that you alluded to, whether it's filterless tanks you know, or the Wallstead method, is people make these truth claims and say this is the way to do it. And it, it frustrates me to no end because I talk with a lot of people at the swaps and I talk with a lot of people via comments on YouTube and they will hear these claims about how you don't need a filter and that filters are stupid and they're a waste of money. 
And they don't understand because the person who made those truth claims is not explaining the nuance behind what it is they're actually doing. And it is a very limited, ex a very limited experience with that, a very limited success with that. You have to have heavily planted. You can't have a high bio load. You, you look at people who do that and it does work. It absolutely works. But if you don't explain the fact that it is not going to work in a lot of other situations, and in fact, it won't work in most situations where tanks are stocked on like the way an average person does it, you've just created a claim that is now harmful to the industry and harmful to that person's ability to succeed in the hobby. Yeah, that's what I was saying about everything being different. I mean, every yeah. single aquarium is its own individual little piece of nature. There are no two aquariums that are identical. And I, I loved the way you framed that because it's so true. When you, when you present something on the internet as a fact, but it is a fact pertaining to your setup, but you present it in a way that everybody believes that all aquariums are that way. That's a problem. And listen, this has been an ongoing thing. Uh, it's, it's my point of view versus Lou from Father, Father Fish, who is a guy that I, I don't have a problem with. Him and I, we don't have beef. We hung out with him in, in Orlando yeah. a few years ago. He's a good dude. Uh, definitely one of the old timers in this industry. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, he's a guy that he sets up his aquariums a very particular way. A modified version of the Wallstead method is what he does with a little bit thicker sand uh, on top layer and all of that kind of stuff. Fine. It works. It absolutely works for that situation, yeah. for that tank that is properly stocked, heavily planted. And the, the claim is you don't have to do water changes. And he's right. I mean, it, it, you know, we have tanks that are set up. We don't call it the father fish method. We use the proper title of the Wallstead method. We have uh, tanks that are set up that way. And we rarely, it, sometimes Lisa does like little water changes just, just because she doesn't necessarily have to. So it definitely works. It is, is something that can be applied if your tank is set up that way. But if yeah. I was to do that with this tank right here behind me, you're watching in video, I'm sitting in front of a 240 gallon African cichlid tank. It would be catastrophic yeah. if I just said, well, I don't have to do water change in there because Father Fish said I don't have to. No, what Father Fish said was, if your tanks are set up like mine, then you don't have to. And he's right, but in, it doesn't apply to all aquariums. And that's, that's something that I struggle with is that person that that hears that or anybody else that's presenting something like this as this is this is just the way it is and everybody can use this strategy no you definitely can't it works for that kind of a tank lucas bretz has success with his tanks because of the way he has his tanks set up and lou has success with his tanks because of the way they're set up that wouldn't apply to my tank, almost any of my tanks. Some of Lisa's mm -hmm. tanks, yes, but mine, no way. I'd be dealing with a whole lot of dead fish. So, you know, and my, my thing I struggle with is the person who watches that, that's brand new to this, that doesn't know anything, and they see that and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to go get my 55. I'm going to put three Oscars and a Jaguar cichlid in there, and I'm never <laughs> going to do water changes because he said I don't have to. Uh, no, that person's going to have a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, again, that's the thing when it comes to, you know, we're talking, really what we're talking about is how is information reliable and how do you know information is reliable? And that's why I went back to the whole consensus thing, because you do need an element of that. Even the consensus is not always going to be correct. If you wind up, like you said, with a trend and then everybody just jumps on, jumps on the trend and tries to expand that trend in places it's not supposed to be, right? Uh, whether that is a filterless aquarium or cleaning sponge filters and tap water, uh, there, are, there are limitations to most things in the aquarium hobby in terms of the information that you're getting outside of, okay, well, there's a, there's a thing called a nitrogen cycle, and that's what happens in your water. Like some of the, the real hard science that's just, it's unavoidable. But you know, in terms of 
how we keep fish, there is a, a tremendous amount of nuance there. And I hope that for people who are looking at getting into a different part of the hobby or they're newer to the hobby, consider, consider somebody's experience, right? How much experience do they have? Not just length of time, but the number of different types of fish that they've kept, the types of fish they've kept together. You know, I, there's another really good example, the red tail shark. I did a species profile on the red tail shark years ago, and I still get comments on that video. You're wrong. My red tail shark is a model citizen in my 20 gallon aquarium. He's never touched anybody. And my response is always, well, how large is your red tail shark and how long have you had the fish? Because what happens is they become, they're, they're really actually pretty decent fish when they're small, right? The juvenile red tail sharks are wonderful. And then they get a little larger, they get into their teenage angst years and they become <laughs> very angry adults. And so my almost seven inch red tail shark ruled that tank. There were cichlids in there. There were all kinds of fish and he was the tank boss. And it can be a little bit scary when you see there could be consensus for people who don't have the experience. They haven't kept that fish for five, six, seven years. They've kept it for a year and think, man, I've had this fish for a whole year. I got it. It was, it was one inch and now it's like three inches. And I, this guy is an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about, man. You are just, you're a horrible human <laughs> being. I'm unsubscribing. You gave all the bad information when really, again, how many red tail sharks have you had? Have you been keeping them for the last 40 years? Have you been keeping them in different environments with different types of fish and different size fish tanks? And have you gotten them to the size where they're five, six or seven inches? Well, not every single time will those fish just lose their minds and destroy everybody in the tank. It depends on the fish you're keeping them with. And every once in a while, yeah, you're going to get one that's decent. But overwhelmingly, those fish, when they get big, they get mean. It's just, the way, it's just what they do. Every fish is different. They all have their own attitudes. And even fish that the book says are notoriously mean mm -hmm. might not be. Uh, that's true. And, you know, you are a great example of that. You and you showed this on YouTube, which I loved. You kept Oscars with peacock cichlids. And I Still remember do. being in your house, seeing that yeah. and saying, I love the balls on this guy to yeah. do that. Not, I know it's okay to do that, mm -hmm. but to show that on YouTube and stuff like that. So many people would be, oh, oh my God, how, how can you even do that? There were fry this big swimming around in a tank with Oscars in it. What? Yep. And, not, and they're not all going to act the same. Yeah. And I still have that same tank. The Oscars have, have passed, but I've got two, what I call my catch all 125. There are two, uh, vieja, uh, Argentia. These are big fish. These are aggressive, All right, This is not an Oscar. These fish right now are, they were my bucket list fish, fish, vieja Argentia are amazing. Right now they're probably seven, eight inches in with a whole, you're going to love this. This is everything you would be told via consensus never to do. I've got those two big bruisers in there. The fact that both of them are even in the same tank is interesting, and yet they leave each other alone. There are peacock cichlids, mostly dragon blood, some red empress, eureka reds, silver dollars. I have, this is where you're, where you're really going to wonder about me. I have the rainbow cichlid, a big group of rainbow cichlids. These are very docile, three and a half, four inch fish, group of them catch all tank. We're moving a lot of stuff around. I've got a group of Brashardi, Lake Tanganyika fish in there. <laughs> I have a, I still have a group of Thrichthys macula pinnis, which are like fire mouth like cichlids in there, along with three or four really interesting loaches. Do you know how many problems I have in that tank? Zero. Am I telling you to go out and mix these fish together? No, because it was a very specific way in which I did it. The stocking levels are very specific. I would never in a million years tell somebody, take that stocking list, go out there, repeat it. I promise you 99 times out of a hundred, you are going to have, an, you're going to have not many fish left over, but people have seen that tank like, oh my gosh, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the rule the book says. Levels, these fish should be having problems. Not a single one of them does. Then we always get the argument. Well, what about water parameters? Hey, I had 80 tanks in my fish room, every single tank had the same water parameters. So as long as the frontosa was separate from the geophagus, nobody ever said anything. But when they were together, they need different water parameters. Well, they didn't have different water parameters when they were separate and they don't have different water parameters. Now they all eat roughly the same foods. 
they have temperaments that are getting along based on the stocking conditions. If I changed even a couple things, would it change the whole dynamic of the tank? Probably. And maybe I'd have a disaster. But for right now, and by the way, it's been working out for years. It's not something I mixed together last week and said, well, let's see what happens. This has been years and years and years. And this is. I was fascinated to see that tank because I, I just loved it. And you had the big giant tilapia at the, the time. Tilapia, and yeah. I was just like, that is so cool to see all of those together. I have a question for you, though. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're getting close on time. I know we're going to huh? you're going to want to wrap things up here. But uh, what about back in the 80s, 90s? I mean, I started in 93, but where did you get reliable information that you could trust back then because to me there was only one source but what about you there was well there was probably there were probably four or five sources but most people only used one source so 70s 80s 90s you had fish keeping books i remember as a kid we had fish keeping books in our house and you kind of read through them very general information but fairly solid information there were fish keeping periodicals back then so you could get information there I remember it wasn't something that we subscribed to back in the 70s or 80s, but they were there. And then you, of course, had there were still fish clubs. They weren't nearly as popular as they are now. And so there were still ways like for an adult, if they wanted to try to track down a fish club, they, they had those. But the point that you're getting at in the main way was you went to the pet store and you talked to the person that was working there and they would tell you, OK, yeah, you can do this or maybe not do that. Of all of those things, the pet store was the most hit or miss for me growing up because uh, there's competing, there's there's a conflict of interest there in terms of information. One, they want to sell you the fish, but they also don't want you to have major issues. And so I can remember doing a lot of really crazy things as a kid because they're like, oh yeah, I told this, I think I told this story in one of the earlier podcasts, get two of every type of Imbuna cichlid. <laughs> two yellow labs, two red zebras, two Kenii, two Sokolofi, and you're like, okay. And now they're, now you've got a problem. Two erratus, you've got all these fish in there. Some of them are aggressive in Buna, some not, but you've got them in pairs. Nowadays, we would never tell somebody that. We would tell right. somebody, hey, if you're going to do an Mbuna tank, first of all, best to have a, a larger tank, a four-foot tank would be great. It's even better if you can keep one species because their communication is all similar. Like you did with your yellow lab tank. I've got, it's off camera here, but the 75 gallon is a mix of yellow labs and pseudotrophia solosi. They're both relatively chilled out, but we've got them in a big group, big meaning six or more. So mm -hmm. that helps reduce the aggression. But yeah, back in the old days, it was you go to the pet store, you talk to the person and hope they're giving you good information. Well, and that goes to, I think, my final point. And you, you did allude to this before. Information is always changing. What we know, what we share uh, what every what the general consensus is is always changing because back then like you said you know they uh, the people at the store probably believed that that was the right thing to do just buy a pair of all of these cichlids that way they have a buddy and that'll help with aggression and everything's going to be fine just like the guy as uh, the same podcast i told the story of the guy telling me get your silver arowana putting it in the 29 gallon tank is perfectly fine because they're not going to be able to build up speed to jump out so and he <laughs> believed that you yeah. know to hear that now is absurd and you, it's laughable but back then it was like well this is this is what it, what we all think and so you know but for for me back then that was my source my only source i have never been a book smart guy uh i can read comic books I'm reading a Spider-Man, or excuse me, a Superman comic right now, Superman American Alien by Max Landis. It's very good. Uh, I can read those all day long, but to try to learn something from a book, if it's not about Superman, forget it. Yeah. I, I'm just, I, I read it and it just, it, it doesn't, I don't absorb it. I see the words, I don't absorb it. I'm a f contact guy. I do it, learn from example, learn from experience. That's the best way for me. So I didn't have, you know, the, the magazines and all that. I would flip through the magazines and say, oh, that's a cool product. That's a pretty fish, but I'm not really going to learn anything from that. So for me, the only option I had was friends and I only had two that had aquariums. Neither one of them really knew anything or the, the, the old guy at the fish store. Yeah. And that was it. And I, I eventually found one that you had the fish store and there were several employees, but the owner was the guy 
that I trusted and I got my information from. And there were times where I needed to know something and I would go in there and he wasn't there that day. Okay. I'm going to come back when he's here yeah. to, to get the answer to my question because these other people, they're telling me to put arowanas in 29 gallon tanks. I, I, I don't feel <laughs> like I can get good. didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, even back then, 1993, it was difficult to find that good source of information. I mean, right now it couldn't be easier, but there's so much of it. It's really, really difficult to know who you can and can't trust. Yep. So I would, I mean, to wrap it up then, if you are looking at who is an expert, I, I think we both agree. It's somebody who has reliable information based on all kinds of experience. The credentials are good. It's a nice add on. It certainly is. But if you're looking for reliable information, you are looking at the individual. What is their resume, so to speak? What is their experience? How much experience in terms of length of time, the number of fish they've kept, the number of tanks that they've had over their time, the number of different ecosystems that they have set up. If they've got paper behind that with some type of a degree, fine. That's, that's an added benefit as to explaining the why things happen. If you find somebody who's a good teacher, because you can be an expert in your field. And trust me, we experience this all the time. I'm sure many of you have gone to college and you get to a class and you're like, this person is an expert, but they are a horrible teacher. So you want somebody that can explain not only the whys and what's happening, but also allow you to appreciate the nuance so that you don't make a mistake later on. And that's what you're looking for as well. You're trying to figure out, hey, is this situation that this person, the advice they're giving me, is it the same situation that I have in my in my aquariums? Uh, consensus can be helpful, but you always have to be, like you said, a little bit careful with the consensus. But the more you hear people saying, here's how to have success in one aspect of the hobby, often there's a reason for that. And yeah, I mean, it's it was, it's been an interesting conversation, John. I, like I said in the beginning, I was looking forward to this one because I knew you were going to have a whole lot to say about it. And I would much rather listen to you than sit here and do all the talking. So this was fun. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. We're going to be back same place, same time next Monday. Again, thank you for all your support and the positivity you've shown us. The community has been absolutely awesome. We hope you have a great week and we will see you again or hopefully you'll see us next week. 